So today we're going to talk about Church of Laodicea. Have you, have you heard about it? Yeah? yeah? I'm, sure, I'm sure you have as an Adventist. <laughs> you know, it was a night of April 14 of 1912. It was an hour before midnight on the cloudless starry night. The sea was utterly calm. The ship, Titanic, was on the sea with about 2,025 souls. It was a, such a peaceful night, and they were sailing beautifully. And it happened. They hit iceberg. They couldn't avoid it. The helmsman swerved to miss it, but the iceberg knifed open the side of the ship like a Titanic can opener. And the ship began to take a seawater. You know, they say they claimed this is not even God himself could sink her. They were very boastful and proud of their ship that they even challenged God. They thought they had everything and need of nothing. But almost mathematically, the unsinkable ship was mortally wounded. So here we have a story of Laodicean, Church of Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. Let me quickly introduce where Laodicea Church is. This is a, a, a Turkey. It's a part of the Turkey. It's east, southeast part of uh, now known as a Turkey. Um, you see all the seven churches here, all right? The, the last one, Laodicea, sits right here in the middle of south, uh, uh, southeast part of the Turkey, okay? Um, Laodicea, city of Laodicea, is known as one of the wealthiest city, ancient cities, right? Uh, because the city is in a trade route. So Ephesus, as you see, do you see Ephesus? Ephesus is on the coastline, and all the trade that comes from the east will go through Laodicea to get to Ephesus, and this goes to Europe, right? So all, all this, this was literally a, the, the trade route, and Laodicea, in the, being in the middle of it, had the benefit of all the wealth. And so, uh, um, and also Ephesus it, it was one of the most important cultural and religious center in, East, uh, in Asia at the time, right? And so it was a huge trade city, and it was known for its extreme wealth, its financial centers and clothing factories, and even very famous medical school. Those were the things that the uh, city of Laodicea was known for. So all they needed was a period of peace where they can trade freely, uh, and it was a period of, period of Rome. And they were so rich that around AD six, uh, 60 AD, a big earthquake completely destroyed the city, right? But they refused the help from the Roman Emperor Nero saying, we got this on our own, All right? Now, this is crazy because I don't know if you know Turkish earthquakes. The, one of the recent ones that I remember was 7.2 magnitude. Uh, 17,000 people died. Over the years, you've heard Turkey's earthquakes, they're well over seven magnitudes. And what, how, how, what, what kind of magnitude that is? that destroys the whole city, right? So literally the whole city was destroyed and they said, we got, in, we got, we got our enough money to build our own city. We don't need your help, all right? So to the church in the city that had it all, look at what Jesus says in verse 15 and 16. It says, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm 
and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I know you have heard this being preached many times, right? Pastors will love to talk about hot, you know, the church needs to be hot, right? Like passionate, active, you know, in, in, the, in the church doing the work of God, right? Right? And that you should not be cold. How that, you know, you're in the world that, 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 that you, you know, you're, not, you're inactive and you're not doing anything. Have you, have you heard that? Right? Have you heard that? All right? Um, so many, when, 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 they, when preachers preach, many uh, times the hot and cold is associated with good or bad. Right? Right? Hot being passionate, fired up for God, doing the work of God, sided with God, cold is, is you're in the world, like not doing anything for God or church or sided with the world, right? This is a knowledge that you've heard very often being preached. You know, I always had a big, big problem with this interpretation. Why on earth would God ever want us to be cold? Right, because the Bible says, I want you to be neither hot, either hot or cold. Meaning, in a way, God is saying, I want you to be cold if you're not hot. But then in my, my head, why would, why would this loving God would ever tell me that I should be cold? Just because I'm between the fence? Just because I'm like, you know, I'm like, quote unquote, lukewarm as half in the church, half in the world, God is saying, no, I don't want you to be in the fence. I want you to be in the world. Get lost. Right? Why would, what would God ever say that to us through this scripture? Right? Have you ever questioned that? I don't know. I did. I, I have a lot of questions. See, I grew up as a pastor's kid. I, I learned a lot. I knew a lot. And I questioned everything. Right? Uh, my faith didn't come until later in my life. Um, I, I, it was my parents' faith. And I had a question over, you know, trust, yes. There's a reason why I say I never wanted to be a pastor. <laughs> okay? And so this question I struggled with. I know my God doesn't just ditch a person like that, right? He says, come to all who are weary and burdened. He always invites us regardless of where we are, what we do. Or however we feel, right? My God will never command a soul to leave him for whatever the reason is, ever. Okay? So I started to dig in about this text. And this blew me away. So let me explain a little bit more about Laodicean city. So the city itself sits in the middle of nowhere. City actually doesn't have a source of water. So they had to bring water from outside. And there's, this is called Tri-City. They have a three cities together. So about 20, about 30 kilometers north of it is a place called Hierapolis, all right? Now, where is that? This looked like a snow with a water puddles, but these are giant steps looking with a huge pools of body. These are hot springs. So when people go to Turkey, this is the place they go to soak up themselves in a hot spring water. Very famous and well known, okay? Right? It's a source of a hot spring water, right? Now, have you ever... Uh, have you ever drank? So basically, they will bring this hot water pipe down through 30 kilometers and gets to Laodicea. Is it hot? No. Have you ever drank cool down high sulfur water? No, you haven't? So basically, Florida tap water is that. <laughs> I don't know why, I don't know if you, like, you gag, like, you want to throw up. Like, high surfer means they smell like sewer, okay, all right? 
Like, I'm brushing my teeth in Florida. I'm like, <laughs> why, why is the water like this? Because high surface content, okay? All right? So would you throw up a cool down high surface water? Yeah, I know you will throw up, okay? All right? Now, in the south uh, uh, east of it, about another 35 kilometers, it's a place called Colossae. Colossae is known for a cold spring water, right? Cold spring water. Now, cold spring water has a high iron content because they come from ground, right? Uh, they, they, they almost like taste like blood. When you carry all that fresh cold spring water down to, through the hot desert to Laodicea, is it cold? fresh anymore no right and so you you know when you when you drink that water it actually tastes like high iron like almost like you know drinking a blood right you will throw up right and so when god says look warm and i'll spit you out of my mouth it's a literally nasty because that's what they are you get what i'm saying now and i thought to myself why does that matter and how does it apply to hot and cold. Let me tell me, what is the function or why do people go to hot springs? Do you guys like to go to hot springs? Why do you like to go to hot springs? You haven't been to hot springs? You're missing out. <laughs> I'm telling you, you're missing out. Anybody, why do people go to hot springs? Healing. Healing. Why? Hot Water, hot spring water heals people. That's why they go, you get, you get to relax, right? You get to soak up that hot water. I guess you do your bathtub. That's a, as close as hot springs as, as it gets maybe. But why, why do you do that? Because you want to be healed. You want to relax and you want to enjoy. You, get, you, you understand what I'm saying, right? What does a cold spring water do? It refreshes it. It rejuvenates it. Like we're thirsty. Thank you for the water. You're thirsty. What do you want to do? You want to drink that cold water. And what does it do? It refreshes you. You're ready to go on the hike again. Right? I, we, our family was just into, uh, we were at Yosemite um, about, about three weeks ago. Um, we almost died hiking up. Like, I wasn't ready. <laughs> I wasn't ready for going up to about 12, uh, uh, 1,800 meter uh, altitude high. I, I wasn't ready for that, but we did it anyway. And my daughter cried going up like, ah, I'm so tired. <laughs> my, my little one will fly around. She, she got energy. But, you know, I, I wasn't fit enough to do that hike. And we almost died. I remember drinking that water, that precious water, to sustain us to go all the way to the top. It, it refreshes us. It gives us energy. Amen to that? Amen to that? So here's an interesting part of what God is saying. By the way, this was the pipe that they used to get the water uh, to get to Laodicea. All right? So they actually built these pipes um, to, to get the water to, uh, to, to the city. So when God is talking about the Odyssean church that I want you to be hot or cold, it's not about being passionate or it's not about being sided with word, wor world, but actually it's talking about the functions of the church. The functions of the church, the functions of Christian is either healing or be refreshing. So our church is supposed to be healing or refreshing. Not just being active or not active, but it's a function of these water makes sense of what we need to be in this church. Amen to that? And that blew me away. Why? It's no longer about God telling me to leave the church <laughs> just because I'm, I'm like lukewarm, Right? But because I have 
the problem is that we have lost the function of those things in the church, right? And that's why if there was a function of hot water continue to be that people will continue to enjoy the healing components of the water. You won't spit it out. You will be in the water. If it's cold, refreshing water, you're not going to spit it out. You'll put it in your body because it will rejuvenate you. Which church is a place supposed to do that? And what the problem of Laodicean church is that we have lost the function of healing and refreshing in the church. You know, it wasn't that God saying, I would rather, I, I would rather you be the worst kind of person uh, than a person who is, you know, trying or even who, who knows what is the right thing to do but doesn't do it, right? Apostle Paul says that even he did not, you know, even he struggled it, right? He always did the things that he didn't want to do, and he didn't do the things that he knew that he should do. He should do. I mean, even Paul himself struggled between the fences, right? What God is saying that these are the function of Christian life. You need to be healing or refreshing a soul. These two are such a beautiful component as what God has given to us through Jesus Christ. Go and heal the hurt, the sick. Go and refresh their uh, souls, those who are thirsty for the truth. Isn't, isn't God our amazing? Isn't our God amazing? You know, not saying that you should rather leave God than, than be half-hearted. Such a wrong message and the portrait of who God really is. But rather, God is encouraging us to do the right thing. The actual work that God has given to us. Go heal a soul and go share truth to refresh their heart. See, lukewarmness is not lack in doing work. It is not about being lazy. In fact, Laodicean church was a very busy, industrious people, right? They were very active church, always busy in doing things. The works were there. That's why Bible says, that's why Bible says, I know your works, amen, right? That's what, they, like, Laodicean church was working. They were active. They were busy. Church was happening, but they lost the function of what church should be, right? So lukewarmness isn't about inactive, but it is about losing the function of those components. You know, but why did God have nothing good to say about this church? We, we understand that there's nothing good that God says about this Laodicean church, unfortunately. Because their works were self-reliance. It was just doing the program. And that church program has lost its power. The function of healing and refreshing was not there anymore. The ministry became about themselves, about self-reliance. I know it all already. Like, have you, have you, have you heard that? I, I know it all already. I've heard it all already. Like, I'm sure you're sitting here listening to me preaching. Oh, I've heard about Laodicean Church before. Uh, preachers preached a million times. I'm sure, I'm sure you do that. Let me ask this one question. Do you sincerely believe before you came to this church today that you will be changed by the Spirit of God? Or did you just come to attend the service, listen to the message you've already heard before, and go back home to the same day-to-day -day life? Why do we do programs when not even many expect that program will change people's life? This is a reason God has nothing good to say. We are busy. We work hard. We do ministry. We do church, but nothing changes. We have truly lost 
the power of healing and refreshing from doing the work of God. Do you know where these problems started from? It's that I know it all. I can do this on my own attitude. The work of self-reliance. I can do, you know, whether it's a school, work, relationship, financial issues, future plans, we think we got it. We think we got it. We can do this on our own. We're fooling our own selves that we got this. So in verse 17 and 18, it says, Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold purified by fire so that you may be rich. With, and, and white clothing so that you may be clothed. And so that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salves so that you may see. You know, we come to church to be healed, refreshed, and blessed. Amen to that? Amen. Amen. But truth is, and this is really unfortunate reality, the truth is many of us are miserable, not happy, just doing the motion of coming to church. We put on a mask on, holy, perfect, happy, and smile. You got no issues. Everybody's perfect here. But sometimes you come to church and you're miserable. And we see them too. Right? They're not happy. All they got to say is to judge somebody, point fingers out, and complain. It doesn't matter how beautiful you look. It doesn't matter how perfect you look, how holy you look. Underneath, inside, we're just wretched, spiritually poor, blind, and naked. We sit here, we judge, we look down upon those who seem like they're less than of us. It's that know-it-all attitude. You know, sometimes we are truly a miserable people. And the biggest problem is that we don't even recognize that we are miserable. We say we stand on the truth to point out all the wrongs in the world. But God says, love one another, forgive one another, work with another, others to show who God is. So God gives, you know, in this text we talk, God is bringing the problem and the solution, right? And the suggestion of it. So the thing is, the condition is need of nothing. That's the problem. But you actually need everything, right? So the city of Laodicea was famous for their banking system. But the real gold isn't being rich. Amen to that? Gold refined in the fire is not only our trials and tribulations, but through it all, it gives us a quality and riches only God can give. Finest of all gold, what would give you a true wealth? What is the most valuable thing in the world? You know what I say? It's a character. Having a true character of God, that's a gold refined. You are the most richest person on earth if you can gain, acquire the character of God in your life. It says, buy for me gold. Amen to that? It's not... It's not given. 
All right? You have to get it from who? God. You are not born with it. Right? You can't even get it on your own. You can only get that from God. Don't ever forget that. There are many nice people out there. Nice isn't the character of God, actually. Character of God is goodness, kindness, different than being nice. Girls, don't ever look for a guy that is nice. I'm telling you, you will be fooled. Evil people can look nice. Cheaters can look nice. Actually, in fact, they are one of the nicest people. <laughs> Amen to that? Yeah. You got to look for a good person, a righteous person, a kind person. Why? Because these are the characteristics of God. I don't, I don't know if there's a Bible verse that says God is nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, right? It's interesting, right? I ask a lot of my young people, like, hey, what kind of, what kind of guy are you looking for? I want a nice guy. Like, you... <laughs> Utterly a failure, right? No, you need to look for a good person. Goodness, kindness, patience, perseverance, long-suffering. These are the character of loving God, amen? And that's what we need to embed it in our heart. Guys, same thing. You don't want a nice girl. You want a girl who tells you the truth. Like my wife. <laughs> Too much. Sometimes. And won't stop. I'm like, I got you. She said, no, you ain't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the building, the character of God that makes you rich. It's not money. It's not position. It's not what you have in your world, but it's what's in you, which is the character of God. Of God. Amen. And so, so, church, I wish and I pray to you from today moving forward that you may try every possible way to establish the character of God in your life. Amen. You know, I, 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 I kind of shared this with our um, uh, young people last night. People talk about, oh, evangelism is hard. Sharing gospel, they're talking about Jesus' heart. You know what? I'll tell you something. <clears throat> the easiest way to evangelize is to just have the character of God in you. You know why? Because you look so different that they will immediately recognize, like, what is wrong with that person? And when they say you're weird, that's the best opportunity to share gospel. Because now you can explain why you're so kind. Because he said, God told me that I should do this. Right? How are you so patient? Because I love God. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to go and talk about, you know, if you don't keep Sabbath, you're going to go to hell. When you have a character of God in you, you're a walking preacher. The world will see that you are with God. That's the best evangelism you can do. And so, stop preaching Sabbath. You know, for Adventist pastors, pastors to, to say that, I'll, I'll be stoned. <laughs> but before preaching Sabbath, please build the character of loving God in your life. Also, Laodicea was known for a famous luxury clothing. They were finest of the Roman Empire. The white clothes represents what? Righteousness of Jesus Christ. You know, when we are in sin, we feel shameful and we feel nakedness. That's our sin, our self. See, we want to cover up the shame, and we do it on our own ways. So we put on our fancy clothes because it makes people to take, our eye, take their eyes off of us 
and they, they focus on what it appears outside. And we hide behind these clothes to make us feel good. And that could be not just fancy clothes. It could be a car. It could be a house. It could be a job. It could be your relationships. It could be jewelries. It could be anything. Anything that can hide you or shield you from seeing who you are because we feel naked and shameful. In our day-to-day life, do we see God or do we see ourselves? In our actions, words, interaction with people, we put up a fake, covered-up self and fake smile. We don't need to cover ourselves with self-made clothes, but put on the clothes washed with the blood of Jesus Christ so that we will see God in our lives. Also, ladies and church have a good medical system, and some doctors are so famous that their, their names appeared on their coins. Especially their, like, medical for eyes were very famous. But the problem is with the Laodicean church, they were spiritually blind. They're spiritually blind. So eye solves are to see it clearly and with better, you can see better, right? Well, eyes have to do with seeing, maybe perhaps reading a book, yeah? Um, something that, uh, a, a book that opens our eyes. Any, any, anything comes to your mind? Perhaps Bible? Yeah? yeah. Spirit of prophecy? Amen? Unfortunately, we are also spiritually blind. We see, but we don't. And God is saying, You need to put on an ice ice house. That you need to spiritually start to see the truth and the reality of things and to fix it. Fix what? Other people? Like your spiritually open, your spiritual eyes are open and you start to see all other people's fault. It starts to see where you are. It starts to recognize how bad I need Jesus. How bad I need the character of God. How bad I need to be clothed with righteousness of Christ. How bad I need the Spirit in our life. See, character of God, righteousness of Jesus, Spirit of prophecy, three in one will will make us whole again. And in verse 19 to 22, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and uh, uh, chase them. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any, anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and he will dine with him, and he with me. To him to overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the what the Spirit says to the church. So here God gives, Jesus gives the solution, right? Solution is to what? Repent and open the door. Repent and open that door, right? It says, be zealous. Be zealous. We need to have a burden, a purpose, and vision for souls. Amen to that? Like, it's not about just coming to church week by week, uh, week after week, right? You know, we, we may sit here, and you know what we become? We become a, a, a pew spiritually obese, being a pew potatoes. I'm telling you, we become spiritually obese. Why? You, because you sit here week, at, week after week, you, you be, being fed by the pastor, and you just sit, and you just sit and listen, and say, oh, that was good. Oh, man, that was, 
I am full. You are full all the time. When are you going to wake up and get up and exercise? When are you going to go out and share the word of God? When are you going to go share the, exercise your faith? Sometimes we Adventists been sitting here all life long and became too fat spiritually. And then when, when it's time to actually go and run to the mountains, I doubt you'll be able to be running, maybe rolling. <laughs> but that's the truth, right? When we sit here, how much of a burden do we have the souls out there? Because if you do, you won't be sitting here. You'll be out there. Be zealous means that we need to have a burning desire to reach for their soul. And you know what, church, let me tell you. There are many young souls in this church, in your household, that needs to be reached. It's not about correcting them, but it's about loving them. It's not about what they do right or wrong. It's about you showing the character of God. It's not about judging what they wear and what they eat and what they listen to. But it's about embracing just like Jesus did. And you know what? Once they understand the character of God, everything will fall in its place. You, that's not your work, by the way. Your work isn't to change people. <laughs> My wife tried it there for 15 years, and uh, <laughs> it doesn't work. Who changes lives? God does. All we've got to do is to show who God is. You know what? Let God do, let God do his work. You, you, you don't, got to, you, don't play God. Like, don't, don't play what, what, what he does. Let, let him do. He's best at what he does. Like, don't take his job from him and say, God, I think I, I could do better. I could, yes, you could do better pointing out other people's and having them leave the church. Yes. But let God do what he does the best. And all we've got to do is to love him. Embrace him. So that you, they can see that you care. That you care. You have a zeal. You have a zeal. You have a zeal. For the lost souls. And he says, repent. Repent. Come to a realization that we are in need of it all. Everything. So we come to Jesus. We come to Jesus. And you know what Jesus does? And he stands and knocks. He, he's knocking Constantly, continually. See, this knocking is a super important thing to understand. So there's a few layers of uh, implications. The first one is, of course, in our personal life, we need to respond to the knocking of the door. Amen? We will, you know, he will be there until we respond and open the door. I mean, he's not going to give up on us. Amen to that? I mean, isn't that amazing part that he will never give up on us. He will never stop knocking. Even if you don't open, he will continue to do it and annoy you until you will open the door. But why is he knocking? Because I am doing things in my way. That's why we left him outside the door. God is saying, no, no, no. Don't do it your way, but do it with me. Together, we will make this heavenly kingdom come true. Not with your ability, skills, and your resources, but in the name of Jesus, with the name of Jesus, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit says Jehovah the host. So it's about doing it with Jesus, amen? It's not, you don't got it. Please keep that in mind. It don't matter how long you've been an Adventist. 
how if it don't matter if you are elder, even if you are pastor, doesn't matter whatsoever. We don't have anything on our own. The knowledge is not ours either. It is given by God. It's given by the Spirit, and we gotta do this together with God. Like, isn't our goal to bring the heavenly kingdom to come true? Then we need to do it with Him. He's the owner of the kingdom, and you're saying, "No, I could, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this to make your kingdom come here without you." We gotta do it together. The second part. See the the Laodicean church has shut their door to Jesus. Church had they shut their door to Jesus. They're saying, "I don't. We don't need you anymore. Since we can do all that on our own, right? We can do the programs on our own. We can we can do the preaching on our own. We can do the teaching on our own. We could we could we could do things on our own." We don't need you, right? It's crazy for us to even think that, but that's the reality sometimes. Jesus is also knocking on the church's door. We need to look into our church life. Are we doing things ourselves only, for ourselves only? Have we been healing the members and the community? Have we been refreshing their souls? To those who come and seek the truth? Or have we been judging based on who they are, what they wear, or where they're from? See, Jesus is knocking on the church's door, asking us to let him in. I mean, we kicked him out of his own house because we think we're so good. And when we invite him in, what does he want to do with us? He said he wants to eat with us, dine with us. See, I'm telling you, eating is one of the most intimate acts of its acceptance and friendship. Amen to that? I mean, you know, when you go on a date, what do you do? You eat, right? If you don't eat, that's not a date, right? <laughs> you know, like... If you go out, if you if you go out with your with with some I mean somebody, what what, what do you do? You you feed them, you eat, right? Because that's that's what you do. That's a, that's a sharing intimate moment together. I mean, like eating together with them will build relationships. Amen. Like you know, my ministry is a a feeding ministry. I I I take my youth out and I just I keep on giving them food. Right? I I raise them, right? The thing is, it's, it's incredible what, you, what happens on the dining table. No? Your history happened over dining table. That's what Jesus wants to do. Jesus doesn't want to come and sit in your couch. He wants to sit with you in the most intimate way possible. When we are opening our mouth and chucking our food in there, we're sharing that moment together of the laughter, of the conversations, the deep, deep conversations. If you haven't had that conversation over food, you better start something. He wants to get personal with us. He wants to be a personal with others who needs our help. He's asking us to stop doing it on our own and relying on him. Is it possible? Of course, yes. Because Jesus says, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He did it. Right? Jesus, he didn't do it on his own way. See, the thing is, he could have done it in his own way, right? Well, Jesus is God. He could have done it in his own ways. But you know what he did? He did it. That's something he didn't do. He did it. Utterly with the power of God. That's, why we, that's where we understand the righteousness by faith. Jesus was literally showing us how to rely on God. He did not use his power at all. He did not rely on his power at all. He utterly spent that everyday time with God, his Father, received the power from God, his Father, and performed those miracles. It wasn't his power, right? 
That's where the same thing he's saying, you could do it too. And Jesus wants us to utterly rely on him. You know, there are so many struggles in our life. And we try to do, we try to do, do it on our own. It is time for us to let go and give it up to God. Jesus on the Gethsemane was the same thing. He struggled. I'm telling you, Jesus struggled just like you and I. He struggled. He was lonely. He was abandoned. He was rejected. He was crying in tears of blood. The struggle is real. And you and I, we all know that. He could not feel God's, God's presence. He wanted to doubt. But he believed in the word. And he relied utterly upon God. You know, churches talk about how we need a true revival in our churches. Have you, have you, have you ever had that conversation? True revivals. Church needs to come alive. What is a true revival? See, true revival isn't doing more programs. True revival isn't just being involved more in the church. True revival isn't just pray more, read more, and study more. The true revival comes with the Holy Spirit. And you know what Holy Spirit does? Holy Spirit heals people and he refreshes people. Amen to that? We've seen that. He's a comforter. He, he heals, he rejuvenates. That's exactly the work of the Holy Spirit. We talk about true revival and we take the components out of what Holy Spirit actually does. Healing and refreshing people. And so do you want true revival in this church? Then we need to be healing. Church, are you ready to heal people that's out there hurting? Never mind the church out there. Are you ready to heal people in here? Are you, are you ready to embrace the difference? Are you ready to comfort those who are hurting? That needs to start from here. It's about creating an atmosphere among ourselves that our young people are welcomed, that they are, they, they, it's a place of healing. It's creating the space so that they can recognize God. And church, are you refreshing people? Where it's the same old, same old, same old week after week. Are you rejuvenated or are you more tired after you go home, after the church service so that you can take some nap? Because if you're refreshed, I doubt you'll be taking some nap. Isn't it true? If you feel refreshed, what you're going to do? You're going to go out there and do sharing the word of God. Instead of, I am tired. Going, I, like, I've done my work at the church. Now it's time for me to go to sleep. You know, sometimes I, may, again, may be stoned, but I say sleeping in Sabbath afternoon is a sin. Because God has given us this day to work for him. If you just became an Adventist, you, need, you deserve some rest. But if you've been here for 10 years, you had enough sleep. <laughs> right? You rested enough. God is saying, remember this Sabbath to go preach who God is. Not for you, not for you to keep on falling asleep. Apparently, church isn't refreshing enough and healing enough that you have to go take a nap. But it is about creating a space and a place where anybody can come in and they're welcomed. It's a place where they come in to hear the truth and be refreshed so that they will go out the rest of the week talking about their experience in this church. And you know what's going to happen? They will come back again. 
They will come back again for more. They will come back again for more. Our young people will be here wanting to be here. Why? You know why? Because they also are rejected out there. And they're always looking for place of acceptance, place where they can be true. They don't find it out there. That's why they go to internet. They, that's why they get Instagram and, and, and TikTok. Why? They put on a fake things and then they're accepted that way. Nobody accepts, accept, accepts them as who they are. And where, where can they be accepted? Here in this church, amen? As whatever they are, they can come and be rested. And that's why God says, come all who are re- uh, weary and burdened. I will give you rest. And so church, are you ready to be cold and hot? All right, can we remind, re- rewind another hour? Can, can, I, can I do this, <laughs> to do this again? <laughs> can we, are we ready to be cold and hot? Are you ready to heal people? Are you ready to rejuvenate, re- refresh people? Amen. Because that's why we are here today. I hope that you are healed. To, to, to recognize the healing God that we have. I hope that you're refreshed today. I hope it was a good time. I hope you're not miserable. But I hope you're happy, genuinely, from inside. And so the world will know that you are happy. Can we do that, church? Amen. And I guarantee you, If you create a space of healing and refreshing, young people will fill this church. Young people will fill. I can guarantee you that. I've seen it. It's happening. And so that I pray, this church is already filled up, praise God. But let's fill it up even more with our young people. And so give that experience to our young people. And the young ones, and the little older ones, all together, create a space that is healing and refreshing for your friends. Because they want to be part of that. And I can guarantee you that. Amen to that?